Welcome everyone to our symposium on the first year of Pope Francis. My name is Mark Bosco and I am the director of the Joan and Bill Hanks Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage. Our mission here at Loyola is to connect with, communicate and foster research that touches upon the intellectual, artistic and ecclesial heritage of Roman Catholicism. It was just a little over a year ago in March that Loyola faculty and students gathered to discuss the resignation of Pope Benedict XVI days before the conclave was to begin to elect his successor. Well, it has been quite a year. In a very short time, Pope Francis has brought a sea change of opinion about the papacy and the Vatican. His pastoral style and dynamic commitment to reform has been what some have called a sort of reset button on how the Catholic Church might engage the contemporary world of both Catholics and the larger uh, world audience. He is a pope of firsts, the first pope from the Southern Hemisphere, the first Jesuit pope, the first pope to take the name of Francis. We have named this symposium Habemus Papam Plus One because there still seems to be a freshness, a newness to the phrase, we have a pope. <laughs> Indeed, one can download the Pope app uh, on your Apple phone and discover a brand new morning homily or an exhortation that Francis has given in the last 24 hours. Even this morning, as you're all well aware of, President Obama has just finished meeting with the Pope Francis in Rome and making it now a lead story for much of today's news. As a way to consider and deepen our appreciation of this first year of Francis's papacy, we have invited an esteemed group of individuals to share their scholarly, journalistic, and personal assessments with us. Our first session today looks at pr Francis's papacy in the context of his Latin American and Jesuit context. Our second session will offer three nuanced perspectives on his papacy to date. And our third session will serve as an extended address by the noted author and journalist, John Allen, who has had the enviable task of keeping all of us informed about Pope Francis's reforms, exhortations, and travels throughout the past year. We will conclude our symposium with a panel discussion with all of our guests, led by our panel host, Kenneth Woodward, author and former religion uh, editor of Newsweek. As we go through this, uh, these sessions, we're going to, if there's time, we'll allow for just one question per person. I know that doesn't seem very fair, but we do have a 45 minute to an hour session at the end of the day where we'll have plenty of time for questions and comments between the panelists and uh, between all of you. So as we begin, I want to thank so many of Loyola's faculty who helped to organize this event, and especially the faculty and staff of the Hank Center for all their logistical support for this day. And I'd like to thank Dr. Reinhard Andres, Dean of Loyola's College of Arts and Sciences, for his financial support for this endeavor. So without further ado, let us begin our first session. You'll, ha you'll find in the programs biographies of the different uh, individuals speaking. But please help me welcome Jesuits Dr. Gustavo Morella of Boston College and Dr. Peter Bernardi of Loyola Chicago, who will speak about Pope Francis in light of his Argentinian Catholicism and his Jesuit life and spirituality. Thank you. I'm from Argentina. I do sociology of religion at Boston College. I am not a close friend of the Pope, so I'm not going to tell uh, <laughs> hidden histories about the Pope. Uh, according to Representative Paul Ryan, Pope Francis doesn't understand capitalism because he is from Argentina, and he has been grown up, he has been influenced by a Peronist government. Ryan's point is that the contextual experience shapes the Pope's view on economy. As I agree that the Argentinian context has influenced Bergoglio's view on many things, as the upbringing of Representative Ryan has shaped his own political view, I want to present here the Catholicism where the Pope raised. I will try to unfold some transformation of Latin American church uh, in the last century and speculate how uh, that experience may influence Francis' tenure at the Vatican. Jorge Bergoglio was born in December 1936. The Great War and the Second World War shook the foundations of Europe 
and put the Catholic Church into a process of redefining its own identity and mission. As a reaction to liberal forces in the 19th century, the Catholic Church has isolated itself against the modern world. The image of the Pope prisoner at the Vatican uh, was a symbol of the Catholic self-understanding in those years. The modern world was threatening Catholicism. Going further with the metaphor, the world wars demolished the prison's wall, walls and left the prisoner at the hands of the secularization of modernization process. Many Catholic thinkers engaged in a dialogue with Christian sources and contemporary philosophy looking for a new understanding. This movement was known as Nouvelle Theologie, and those theologians were concerned about, uh, the, were engaged with the quest of modern culture and made efforts to understand it. But dialogue was not the only answer. Some other Catholics uh, wanted to fight back the secular forces. For them, the right thing to do was to install a new Christendom regime, something like Francisco Franco was doing in Spain in those years. Both stances of what the Catholics should do in the war crash in Second Vatican Council. In those years, Argentine politics were marked by the appearance of Juan Perón. His first uh, office was in 1943. Peronist hostilities to the opposition in the 1950s ended up with a military cup in 1955 that banned Perón and his party from political life. While some civilian presidents in the early 1960s tried to solve the problem by allowing some political space for Peronism, the military strongly opposed to any negotiation with Perón and his followers. The banning on the Peronistas, an industrial work-based party that was followed for almost the half, most of the half of the voters, profoundly delegitimized the Argentine political system. In June 1966, the army decided to stop the tutorship and the general Juan Onganía assumed the government. Bergoglio joined the Jesuits in 1958. A year later, the Cuban Revolution shook, shook the basis of Latin America. The revolutionary success showed Latin American uh, that it was possible to get rid of their banana generals. Most of Latin American armies were concerned for the Cuban influence or their own territories. Many of them, the, the army chiefs, had been trained in the School of the Americas and had learned that they were fighting a war against communism. The national borders were not only a geographical thing, but mainly an ideological problem. The frontier was inside the country, in any place where Western civilization was challenged. Since General Onganía was trying to impose this model of national security state, he, uh, he wanted uh, to defend the Western Christian civilization, he needed religious legitimation. A blessing from the church would make a government Argentinian, and that was what any, what, uh, all the thing that Onganía needed. Looking for church support, Ongani appointed a number of Catholics in his cabinet. He signed a new concordat with the Vatican and seemed to advocate for the rule of Catholic values in every single aspect of private and public life. The bishops were delighted. The problem was that the world has changed, and so the church. The civil rights movement here, the student revolts in France, the Cuban Revolution, all of those things had a Catholic counterpart in the Second Vatican Council, the theological transformation that led to the Medellin Conference and the birth of liberation theology. The church went from rejecting the world, that idea of the Pope prisoner at the Vatican, to embracing it and to acknowledging Latin America's Catholicism. So the simultaneous transformation of the Catholic Church and the Argentinian political system were in opposite directions, while Catholicism was opening to a dialogue and new forms of mission, the local political system was closing ways of participation. So what the Catholic should do in the 60s? The debates held in parishes and schools ended up in immersion experience. There, supported by nuns and priests, 
middle class youngster Catholics discover human, hu urban and rural poverty. Then when they wonder how to change things, they found that the democratic way was closed. With no place for democratic political activities, revolution was the only possible path. Many Catholics joined and founded Cuban-like guerrillas organizations. Bergoglio was studying in those years in Argentina as a for, as a Jesuit, in the Jesuit Formation House. Nouvelle Theology was the theology that was taught in those years. He became a kind of scholar on Romano Guardini, a famous uh, theologian. And, and in his early uh, writings, in Bergoglio's early writings, uh, the influence of, of Juan Perón's political thought is, is evident, at least from my point of view. He became, he was ordained priest in 1969. Uh, in 1979, he became rector of students. And from 1979, uh, and he finished in 1985. So those 14 years were critical, a very difficult time for the country. The spiral of violence that started in 1960s has worsened by 1975. Many sectors and most of Catholic bishops hoped the army would put an end to the social chaos. The idea of a coup d'etat wasn't alien to Argentine politics, but despite the cap in 1976, violence did not ease. To get an insight of those years, I studied the case of a Catholics persecuted during state terror. Um, in August 1976, the Argentinian army kidnapped a group of five seminarians and a priest in Cordoba. They were from the La Salette congregation, uh, a New England-based uh, province in those years. The priest was an American citizen, James Wick, from Clinton, Massachusetts. The seminarians were Argentinian. Because the priest was an American citizen, uh, Here's better. Because the priest was an American citizen, the State Department get involved at the very beginning. Uh, I have the opportunity to interview the people. They survived uh, all the whole torture sessions. And the important thing for my research was that those seminarians were tortured by military who claimed to be Catholic. So the, the torture sessions were a debate about what's it, what did it mean to be Catholic in those years in Argentina. The research shows that there were a group that I call committed Catholics who were close to the people, and because of that, near to the victims. Vatican II inspired many Catholics to get closer to the world they lived in. If for European Catholics the problem was that contemporary culture was distanced from God, the same urge was interpreted in Latin America as getting closer to the world of the poor. In the case that I studied, the La Salette, they read their congregation, the congregation's original charisma in the light of the post-council Catholicism. Our charisma is to be with the marginalized by the church and the world. That's why we open houses and bed in peripheral neighborhoods, told me James Wick. The Argentinian La Salette wanted to live in direct contact with the poor. The commitment was with the gospel who had to live with, we have to live with the poor as the poor. Other Catholics saw religious and social transformations as a threat to the world that they know. They wanted to fight back. For that reason, I call them anti-secular Catholics. They labeled any transformation as Marxist, as, and were collaborators of the state terror in their fight against communism. They condemned the lifestyle of engagement with the world that the committed Catholics had. The military told them, and I quote, they had to live in houses that resemble the military structure, big houses, respectful houses. With evidently did not fit in their definition of what the Catholic should be, says James, said James Wick at the hearing in the US Congress in September 1976. The anti-secular Catholics attacked committed ones because they despised them as fake Catholics to the extent that during the prison, the La Salette priests and seminarians were banned from religious rites like mass, communion, or even the access to the Bible. There were other sec Catholic sectors that I call institutional Catholics 
who didn't in the, in identify the church with the government, but wanted to keep a fair relation with it. Their main worry was to preserve the institutional place of the church in the political field. Because of that position, they did not take a public stand against the human rights violations. The idea that the church responsibility included supporting state's authority for the sake of the common good inhibit Argentinian Catholic elite to protest, to protest openly when reliable sources told them about torture. They tried to cool off the rage of the committed Catholics, working behind the scenes, asking for particular cases, helping private persons, and they also tried to calm the government acting as mediator. This is the most important criticism that committed Catholics had on the institutional ones. When they were persecuted, institutional Catholics did not defend them. The church was not considered persecuted, told me Daniel, one of the seminarians. They felt that we were all a bunch of weird people. Because the institutional Catholics did not think about them as real Catholics, they never considered that the church itself was suffering persecution. 200 uh, official church leaders, bishops, priests, nuns, and lay persons were killed during the state terror in Argentina. Paradoxically enough, the social location made institutional Catholics also unreliable for the anti-secular ones. The church never expelled nor sanctioned committed Catholics. According to the military, that was possible be because the church itself was infiltrated. They considered Paul VI an heretic, Bishop Primatesta of Cordoba, who is usually considered a conservative, was named as a red pig in the torture sessions in the military garrisons. They identified themselves with Bishop Marcel Lefebvre, with this style of Catholicism, and openly they acknowledged Lefebvre as their leader. Institutional Catholicism, I think, was Bergoglio's location. He didn't encourage committed Catholic stance in the 70s, kept trying to keep the Jesuits out of trouble. He helped some people to get out of the country, but he kept good relations with the government. By the end of the 80s, Argentinian society has changed a lot, and those changes affect the way people related with religion. Argentina became a democratic society, and much more a plural one. Nowadays, there are almost 10% of the population who declares evangelical, and another similar group who identifies an, as knowns. In some cities, the interreligious dialogue has grown, and even the classical Te Deum, this kind of Thanksgiving celebration for the National uh, Day, has become an interreligious pr uh, prayer. In the early 90s, when Bergoglio was appointed Bishop of Buenos Aires, that was in 1992, the church was struggling with his own behavior during political violence. Most of the public opinion took for granted that the church was a collaborator of the military government in, it, in its massive killings. The church lost legitimacy. However, Catholicism would find a way to rebuild legitimacy, relocating itself vis-a-vis -vis the civil society. During the 90s, Argentina voted for a neoliberal government that took the country under social, under structural economic transformations. Almost 40% of the population was living under poverty. The social inequality produced political instability, and popular manifestations overthrown a government in December 2001. The church, mainly Caritas, our version of the Catholic Relief Service, helped people in their struggle with poverty. The church recovered in that way part of the lost legitimation due to its assistance to the poor. As a consequence of the crisis, Argentinian society demanded a new kind of leadership. Setting exemplarity was Bergoglio's way of showing this new style of leadership. His austerity is authentic. He has always been a regular man. But he's not naive about power. He knows how powers work. He fought for keeping the church social influence and some privileged status within Argentinian institutional system. He played in the Argentinian political game, meeting with the opposition, as well as representing the Bishop Conference in the talks with the government. 
In the same time, he developed excellent relations with the Jew community of Buenos Aires and attended Pentecostal meetings. It's uh, well known that there was a meeting of 5,000 Pentecostal pastors. He visited them. He nailed in front of them and asked them to pray for him. Conservative Catholics were not happy about that at all. Okay. Uh, he has always been independent in his way of preaching. Uh, while he, uh, he was tenured, we, while he was bishop in, in Buenos Aires, he never repeated the curia of the Pope's statements. In his homily, he's, he has his own thought. I mean, he, he, speak, he spoke by himself. He has been respectful of folk Catholicism and close to the people. And in Argentina, some theologians made a distinction. Uh, they don't like the category of poor because they said that it's a kind of sociological or even economical category that emphasized the lack of things of the people. And because of a Marxist influence, they said, well, the poor need a kind of enlightened vanguard that free them from their slavery. Those theologians, and I think that Bergoglio is part of that group, prefers the category of people because it's more theological it's the Second Vatican Council idea of the people of God. But also, it's much more linked with the populist tradition of Latin American leaders. And the category of people emphasize the richness of the popular culture. Uh, even some of them talk about the theology of the people instead of liberation theology. Like, it, was a, it is a version of uh, liberation theology in, in Argentina. In that sense, I understand that Francis Church of the Poor is not either liberationist nor paternalistic. For me, it's an acknowledging of a fact. 71% of the Catholics of the world are poor. It's not an ideological statement. It's just a, it's a fact. Mm? The problem is that they are served for 45% of the personnel, so at least a church of the poor means a better distribution of church resources. In less than a year, the image of the church is other. However, I don't think it's just a makeup of a kind of press operation. Uh, in February 2013, the Boston Globe told us about Monsignor Kevin Walling from Connecticut in a sort of incarnation of the TV show Breaking Bad, the priest ran a methamphetamine operation that gave him a revenue of $300,000 that he laundered in a sex toy shop. Six months later, August 2013, the Boston Globe said uh, that the Pope asked to the empty convents in Italy where the church owned 30% of the country's real estate to open their doors to the migrants, who, by the way, are not Catholic or Latinos. They are Muslim coming from the East. Okay? I think that we need more time to assess Francis' tenure, but there are things going on. There are some uh, facts changing. We should keep in mind when we think about the Reformation in the Curia, uh, that he's one of the cardinals, a group of 120 males that runs the whole Catholic Church. And the cardinals, and not the Jesuits, appointed him as a pope. And I mean by that, that he has support. He's not a lone ranger. I mean, there is a group among the cardinals in the Curia that voted for him are, and I think are supporting him in this kind of transformation. However, Francis' main focus is not the curia. He's relocating the church in the public sphere. He puts the office closer to the people in his lifestyle, his homilies, the way he's using the media, communicati communicating through interviews, all are signs of this approach. And a last thing. In spite he's the head of the Vatican City state, he renewed his Argentinian passport, which is a <laughs> reason for proud, national proud for us. But the interesting point, the interesting point 
is he says he said he wanted to travel the world as a, any regular Argentine citizen. And this is telling something about the desired location for the church, for the Holy See, under Bergoglio's tenure. He's not looking at the state and the state relation. He's, he's resigning his ability as, as head of a state to travel as a head of state, but putting the church in a different position. And I think uh, he's looking for rebuild the ability of the church of being an actor in the public social sphere. Thank you very much. Thanks to the Hanks Center, its director, Mark Bosco, for sponsoring this event, to uh, Gabija and John Crowley Buck and all who have had a hand uh, in this and for the invitation to participate. Thanks to all of you for being here. <clears throat> Last year, the surprise election of Jorge Mario Bergoglio as Bishop of Rome was unprecedented in several respects. The first pope from the Americas, the first pope from the Southern Hemisphere, from the ends of the earth, as he memorably put it, from the Global South, where approximately two-thirds of the world's Roman Catholics now live. The inspired choice of the name Francis, after St. Francis of Assisi, was also unprecedented and broke a millennial-old tradition, accepting the recent innovation of the combined papal name of John Paul. This is the first time that the Bishop of Rome has opted for a name not held by a predecessor, since the ill-fated Pope Lando, early 10th century. In case you're wondering, there was no Lando II. That was his given name. <clears throat> the symbolism conveyed by the name Francis is polyvalent. It signals the new Pope's expressed desire that the church more effectively identify with the poor. It also suggests the values of simplicity, dedication to dialogue, and concern for the environment. But this choice also highlights the reform mandate with which Bergoglio was elected. And of course, Francis, back in the early 13th century, heard a voice from the, the crucifix in the small chapel of San Damiano on the outskirts of Assisi, go Francis and repair my church. Jorge Bergoglio is the first Jesuit to be elected pope. On the return flight last summer from World Youth Days in Brazil, he spoke quite forthrightly about his Jesuit Ignatian orientation. Quote, I feel a Jesuit in my spirituality, in the spirituality of the exercises, the spirituality deep in my heart. I feel this so deeply that in three days I will go to celebrate with the Jesuits the feast of St. Ignatius. I will say the morning mass. I have not changed my spirituality, no. Francis, Franciscan, no. I feel a Jesuit, and I think as a Jesuit. I don't mean that hypocritically, but I think as a Jesuit." Unquote. Perhaps the greatest gift that Francis brings to the church springs from his Ignatian spirituality, a gift which the secular media are incapable of appreciating. This is clear in the way that Francis invites people to encounter the Lord Jesus in ways that recall the second week of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. This theme is recurrent in his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, in the Aparacita final report of which he was the principal redactor. The encounter with the Lord is the vital personal foundation of church renewal and evangelization. Now this was the focus of a presentation I gave recently at another area Catholic University, uh, and I'm not going to repeat it today, but you can watch it online. Uh, the link is at our theology department website. Perhaps some of our other speakers will speak to this very important topic. My presentation today has another focus. Francis has captured the global imagination, his simplicity, humility, and moving pastoral words and gestures, <clears throat> his visit to Lampedusa, pictured on the, that's a, a scene from, on the left, his washing and kissing of the feet of the incarcerated young people, pictured on the right, including a young Muslim woman, his embrace of Venezia Riva, 
have touched people's hearts well beyond the church's membership. Not without ambiguity, Francis has become a global media celebrity. Though not the first pope to be chosen Time Magazine's Person of the Year, two previous papal honorees on the cover of Time will be canonized next month, his image on other magazine covers is truly amazing. <clears throat> but this is my favorite. The New Yorker back in December when winter was still fun. <laughs> However, all this media hype might suggest an overly sharp contrast between Francis and his predecessors. I want to set Francis in this presentation today in a larger papal historical context with special attention to the relationship between papal primacy and Episcopal collegiality to indicate how Francis both contributes to a renewal of the Petrine ministry that builds on contributions of his predecessors, but also how he breaks new ground. Needless to say, on account of time constraints, my historical review will be sketchy. Several centuries before the great schism in the 11th century that resulted in the Orthodox churches separating from Rome, Pope St. Gregory I, Pope from 590 to 604, the first monk to occupy the chair of Peter, claimed the humble title, Servant of the Servants of God, and expressed an understanding of the Petine ministry that Vatican II sought to retrieve. Quote, my honor is the universal honor of the church, my honor is the solid vigor of my brothers. Then am, I, then am I truly honored when the honor due to each and every one is not denied. But in the medieval period, what church historian John O'Malley terms the papalization of the church resulted that characterized the Roman Catholic Church throughout the second millennium of its history. This consequential development was set in motion by the 11th century Pope Gregory VII serving as Bishop of Rome soon after the Great Schism in the 11th century, Gregory was a tenacious reformer of feudal corruptions, for example, the investiture controversy. Yves Congar describes the Gregorian reform at that time towards a juridical ecclesiology dominated by papal institutions as the greatest turning point that the church has known. Over the centuries, a, a system of absolute papal monarchy took shape and the Pope came to be viewed as the source of all authority in the church, mirroring her secular counterparts. Efforts to heal the great schism foundered. Church historian, German Jesuit Klaus Schatz asserts that, quote, ultimately it was the question of primacy that was the decisive reason why union was never achieved with the Orthodox churches. The West repeatedly attempted to impose on the East a monarchical ecclesiology that saw the Pope as the only visible head of the church." Unquote. Fast forward to the modern period. In the modern context that includes the rise of nationalism, the rejection of papal authority by the Protestant reformers, enlightenment rationalism and its more sweeping rejection of church authority and tradition, and then the French Revolution. The church was understandably on the defensive and quite concerned to safeguard its prerogatives, divine and otherwise. What is termed the ultramontane papacy came to a head at the First Vatican Council, 1869 to 1870. Having defined papal primacy and infallible teaching authority, the First Vatican Council bequeathed to the church a one-sided papalist understanding of the church that could be imaged as a pyramid with the pope at the apex and authority descending from the top down. Some theologians in the wake of Vatican I opined that church councils were no longer necessary because papal authority was sufficient to resolve any doctrinal or disciplinary problems. Fast forward to 1958. Pope John XXIII's papal installation was still marked by the symbols of the monarchical legacy. For instance, the coronation with the triple tiara, symbol of the Pope's prestige as a ruler. Within a hundred days of his election, he stunned the curial cardinals with the announcement of his intention to convoke an ecumenical council for the sake of adjournamento. Next year marks the 50th anniversary of the closing of the greatest church event in the modern era. 
The bishops of the majority at Vatican II sought to redress the imbalance between the center and the periphery, between the universal church and the local churches, between primacy and Episcopal collegiality. Vatican II's doctrine of collegiality, considered by Karl Rahner to be the most promising of Vatican II's church teachings, effectively reinserted the Pope into the church, the Bishop of Rome into the College of Bishops. The doctrine of collegiality is the key for the development of the theology of the local church. It signaled a shift from the pyramidal papal monarchical understanding of the church to a decentralized unity and diversity communio ecclesiology. Of course, Rahner stressed that Vatican II was only the beginning of a beginning. Recalibrating the relationship between papal primacy and Episcopal collegiality and synodality became an important desideratum in the post-conciliar era. But its implementation, to say the least, has been rocky. It is a central component of the unfinished agenda of Vatican II. Pope Paul VI, having brought Vatican II to a successful conclusion, instituted certain reforms, both symbolic and substantive. He donated the papal jewels, shrunk the papal court, abolished both the slipper kiss and the papal noble guard, and most notably, he abandoned the triple tiara. He sought to reform and internationalize the Roman Curia, namely the various offices that assist the pope in his Petrine ministry. More importantly, he gave the doctrine of collegiality juridical status by instituting regular synods of the world's bishops. However, in the post-conciliar era, there have been frequent complaints about the tightly controlled management of the synodal process, especially during the long pontificate of John Paul II. Pope Benedict allowed a greater freedom of speech at the synods over which he presided. Pope Francis has indicated his intention to renew the synod as an instrument of collegiality, both in its preparatory process and the rules under which it is conducted. In the celebrated interview that was published last September in Jesuit periodicals, including uh, Matt Malone, uh, 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 the editor of America, played a role in that, Francis said, quote, maybe it is time to change the methods of the Synod of Bishops, because it seems to me that the current method is not dynamic. This will have an ecumenical value, especially with our Orthodox brethren. From them, we can learn more about the meaning of Episcopal collegiality and the tradition of synodality. In ecumenical relations, it is important not only to know each other better, but to recognize what the Spirit has sown in the other as a gift for us." Unquote. The preparation for the Synod of Bishops on the Family, scheduled for next October, includes a survey designed to discover what Catholics think, uh, the uh, Catholics in the pews, what they think about family-related topics that the Vatican sent to all the bishops' conferences. Of course, there's been some controversy about that. Also significant is the scheduling of a follow-up World Synod of Bishops in 2015 that will allow for a more in-depth study of these topics and a working out of effective pastoral guidelines. That the papacy is a major ecumen ecumenical stumbling block was acknowledged by Pope Paul VI. Pope John Paul II went further in his 1995 encyclical Ut Unum Sint, that all may be one, he called for, quote, a patient and fraternal dialogue whose object would be, quote, to find a way of exercising the primacy, which while in no way renouncing what is essential to its mission, is nonetheless open to a new situation, unquote. This important encyclical on ecumenism asserts the need for a conversion of hearts and acknowledges that the Pope can't affect needed changes without the help of others. John Paul stressed the collegial setting of the Petrine office. Notable among the responses to the encyclical was Archbishop John Quinn's 1996 Oxford lecture that identified Roman over-centralization and the need for reform of the Roman Curia as the two greatest current problems in the exercise of the papacy. Apropos of this, a poignant exchange occurred between Pope John Paul and the great Brazilian churchman leader, Cardinal Paulo Avaristo Arntz. Arntz is reported to have challenged John Paul on why he did not spend more time taking the curia in hand. The Pope replied, 
The ideal in my life as Pope is to bring the name of Christ to all the people in the world. As long as I am capable, that is what I will do, unquote. Arndt said to him, but the Curie and the church and the relations with other churches are also important. To which John Paul responded, very important, but my work will be to announce the gospel in the world, and then another pope can do as he wants afterwards. <clears throat> Undoubtedly, John Paul's successor, Pope Benedict, as unfortunately rather, unfortunately, John Paul's successor, Pope Benedict, had to pr prioritize other concerns. And the dysfunction in the Curia worsened, capped off by the Vatileak scandal. Bergoglio was elected with a mandate to clean up the mess. Nevertheless, Pope Benedict did make a significant contribution to restoring a sense of proportion to the papacy with his unexpected resignation from the papal office. While a resignation of a pope is not unprecedented, the last one occurred 600 years ago, not common, this is the first time in church history that the Bishop of Rome has resigned on account of the infirmities of age. Quote, Benedict said, my strengths due to an advanced age are no longer suited to an adequate exercise of my ministry, unquote. In effect, Benedict applied to the Bishop of Rome what Vatican II's decree on the bishops prescribes for bishops who have become less capable of fulfilling their duties because of the increasing burden of age, unquote. It will take time. It will take time for the full ramifications of Benedict's humble and courageous act to become, to become known. But the very decision to resign has helped to demystify the papal office and has further opened the door to a new balance between primacy and collegiality. From the beginning of his Petrine ministry, Francis has made symbolic gestures that indicate his understanding of the Petrine office as a collegial pastoral ministry, for example, describing himself as Bishop of Rome. It is well known that Francis has named a globally representative advisory group of eight cardinals, the C8, six of whom are diocesan bishops, to assist him in carrying out the needed reforms. High on their agenda is making a sweeping revision of the church's central structures. The very formation of the C8 is in itself a significant, significant collegial act. In his programmatic ex apostolic exhortation, Evangelia Gaudium, issued last November, Pope Francis expressed his intention to pursue, pursue the pastoral conversion of the papacy and its central structures. Quote, since I am called to put in effect into practice what I ask of others, I too must think about a conversion of the papacy. It is my duty as the Bishop of Rome to be open to suggestions which can help make the exercise of my ministry more faithful to the meaning which Jesus Christ wished to give it and to the present needs of evangelization. We have made little progress in this regard. The papacy and the central structures of the universal church also need to hear the call to pastoral conversion. He also wrote, excessive centralization rather than proving helpful complicates the church's life and her missionary outreach. Last summer in Brazil, he told the bishops, central bureaucracy is not sufficient. There is also a need for increased collegiality and solidarity. He added that what is needed is, quote, not unanimity, but true unity in the richness of diversity, unquote. In the Spadaro interview I previously referred to that was printed in America Magazine, among others, Francis said, the first reform must be of attitude, the structural and organizational reforms are secondary, that is, they come afterwards. He added that we need time to lay the foundations for real effective change. As the Bishop of Rome, Francis has modeled a humble pastoral style eschewing ostentatious display. Arguably, one of his most important decisions was not to live in the apostolic palace. At the Casa Santa Marta, where he resides with others, he celebrates morning mass with the faithful, as has been mentioned, and gives a brief reflection on the daily scriptures that can be accessed online, uh, as uh, Mark mentioned. <clears throat> he shares community life. Does he have a house job? I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> Paul uh, Francis has been outspoken in criticizing the prince of the church mentality and the careerism that is the bane of ecclesiastics. Borrowing a page from Jesuit theologian Henri de Lubac, he has criticized the spirit of spiritual worldliness in the church. As mentioned, he has indicated he would like a 
poor church for the poor. In comparison with past popes of the, of the last hundred years who were, more dis, who were distinguished by scholarly achievements or diplomatic training, Francis could be aptly compared with the pastoral pope, St. Pius X. Though Pope John Paul comes close, Jorge Mario Bergoglio became Bishop of Rome with many more years of pastoral experience as a residential bishop than anyone since Pius X. And of course, Francis's pastoral populism and simplicity also bring to mind John XXIII. Francis is the first pope in the post-conciliar era not to have participated at Vatican II. As was mentioned uh, by Gustavo, he completed his studies for priesthood after the council and was ordained in 1969. He matured as a Jesuit and then as a bishop amidst the ecclesial ferment in Latin America stimulated by Vatican II. The plenary meetings of Salem, the Latin American Bishops' Conference, Medellin in 68, of course he wasn't present at that, Puebla in 79, uh, Santo Domingo in 92, uh, and especially a Pautacida in 2007, where Cardinal Bergoglio played a leading role, were profound experiences for the Latin American bishops of collegiality and, and pastoral renewal. He was chosen by his fellow bishops to redact the final document of a Pautacida that stresses that all the members of the church are called to be missionary disciples. Francis highlights the mission of the church to the social and cultural peripheries, especially to the excluded. Vatican II's decree on the church's missionary activity states, the church is missionary by its nature. Bergoglio is reported to have electrified his fellow cardinals at the pre-conclave congregations before the vote last March by promoting an evangelizing missionary church that goes out of itself and is not obsessed with her own maintenance and security. Francis has said, that what should drive reform of church structures is the church's mission, not a bureaucratic flowchart. Some significant changes have already been made, and for uh, lack of time, I'm not going to, personnel changes, I'm not going itemize, to itemize those for, for lack of time. I'll mention one, the elevation to the status of cardinal of Lorenzo Baldessari, who is the uh, coordinator of the synodal process, gives him a higher stature in the synodal process of higher stature. He notably uh, preceded the prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith uh, when they received uh, red hats recently. Noteworthy also is the recent appointment of mainly non-European cardinals, several from the poorer countries of Africa, uh, from Latin America, moving the Card College of Cardinals a bit closer, it still has a way to go, but a bit closer to reflecting the reality of global Catholicism. And of course, the creation of the Secretariat for the Economy, Cardinal uh, George Pell is coming from Australia to head that up, and the creation of the Council for the Economy, they're gonna look after the financial and management structures of the Vatican City and the Curia. They initiate the biggest structural changes in the Roman Curia since after Vatican II. Pope Francis has repeatedly spoken out for the essential role of Episcopal conferences and the recognition of their teaching authority. He has said that uh, it needs to be rethought the juridical status of Episcopal conferences to give them genuine doctrinal authority. His apostolic exhortation in itself draws on teachings from the bishops' conferences, especially a parasita. Uh, it's also significant in the uh, pastoral realm of uh, Francis' selection of Cardinal Walter Casper to give a major address to the cardinals who gathered in Rome last month. Uh, last, uh, month. Uh, when he was Archbishop of Rottenburg Stuttgart in the 1990s, Archbishop Casper, uh, along with two German bishops, urged that a process be set up to restore those who, had, who were divorced but were in a stable second marriage to full sacramental life. Rome nixed the idea then, but now it's being discussed. Um, <clears throat> we have a pope who is convinced that creative pastoral ideas come from the periphery, from outside Rome. And with the next October Synod in view, Casper, in effect, initiated a discussion among the cardinals about an effective pastoral solution to the divorced and remarried. So what developments can we expect as this papacy goes on? A more decentralized church authority, altered relationships with bishops' conference, more prudent management of the church's finances, uh, appointing to key positions archbishops and cardinals who have had strong experience in pastoral leadership, who know the smell of the sheep, as 
as the Pope has said. Finally, for the first time in a thousand years, and this is my concluding, uh, sec uh, brief concluding section, finally, for the first time in a thousand years, the Greek Orthodox Patriarch attended the Papal Installation Mass last year. Following the Mass, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, pictured on the right, suggested to Francis that they visit the Holy Land together. Pope Francis responded by embracing the Patriarch. And so in May, Francis will meet Bartholomew in Jerusalem, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the historic meeting in Jerusalem between Pope Paul VI and the Ecumenical Patriarch Athanagoras, which led to the rescinding of the mutual anathemas that dated back a thousand years. By the way, this is what's driving, the, the, this is the prime reason for going to uh, Israel, the uh, Holy Land, uh, to meet with the patriarch. There'll be other uh, things you'll do on the visit, to, to be sure. Uh, the logo for the visit shows St. Peter and Andrew, respectively patrons of Rome and Constantinople, in a boat that is a symbol of the one undivided church. It shows the brother apostles embracing as the wind of the Holy Spirit blows the bark across the waters of this world there. Clearly, Patriarch Bartholomew senses an opportunity for a deeper union with the Roman Catholic Church. A dramatic change since an Eastern Rite bishop reported in 2001 that he didn't know of a single Orthodox hierarch that wanted re was interested in reunion with Rome. Francis effect? This just happened a couple weeks ago. Um, the patriarchs of the Orthodox churches have agreed to hold an ecumenical council in 2016 the first time in 1,200 years that the leadership of all 14 autocephalous, autonomous, orthodox churches will come together. Um, in sum, in his exercise of the Petrine ministry, Francis has been a catalyst towards a new balance between primacy and collegiality and synodality. The spirit is at work.